everyone and welcome to the Redevelopment Commission meeting on November 21st. That date is wrong. On there it is December 19th, 2022. <laughs> um, so we'll need to change the date on the agenda. So first item of business is roll call. Um, so I'll ask for roll call. Jeff Hutton here. Sarah Ballard Jansen here. Randy Cassidy here. All right, Cindy Canardi here. Staff present? John Zoder, the hand department. Christina Finley, hand department. Alex Scarley with Economic Design. Get started here again in just one second. Second. We have a first and a second. Vote via roll call, please. Dale Cotton, yes. 
Sarah Bowerly Danson, yes. Sarah Bowerly yes. Randy Jasper, yes. And Cindy Canardi, yes. Next item of business is a report of officers and committees. Is there a director's report? Uh, just briefly, Madam President, I just want to remind the commissioners our first meeting of 2023 is January 3rd, 2023. That's a Tuesday. I wish you all a good end of the year. Um, I also want to uh, note that this is Commissioner Street's last RDC meeting. She's going off the school board. Her term is up on the MCCSC board. I want to thank her for uh, her service on behalf of the city and, and great uh, having here, Martha. And thanks for all your work. All right, thank you. And I would echo the thanks from the RDC to have you a part of our group, Martha. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, is there a legal report? Uh, just briefly, uh, wanted just to one update uh, is that we had, you all had approved the sale of the uh, showers administration building. At the last meeting, and the buyer decided to waive due diligence and wanted to close on that immediately, and we were able to close on that uh, last week. So thank you, President Canardi, for making yourself available uh, for that. So that property is closed. I'm sure um, Mr. Crowley can elaborate if he so chooses. And then there's also an addition to the business, and I set this out before the meeting, if there has been a change since then. Uh, we would like to add resolution 22. 103 to the agenda, which is um, approval of funding for signage in the Hopewell neighborhood. And so that's a resolution that has been passed out in the room, uh, and we can talk about that more on the agenda as part of the new business later. I just wanted to announce that as part of the additions. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Is there a treasurer's report? Mr. Underwood's on tonight. It's not. Okay. Is there a business development update? Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of what to elaborate on from the, uh, well, I guess I would say that the administration, the Sheriff's Administration building, it's an interesting side fact that it's, uh, it sits inside the opportunity zone. It's being um, actually, uh, the buyer is leveraging that. So that that's actually uh, interesting for us. It's, it's an effort that we put in in 2017 to establish the opportunity zones, one of which was the Trace District, there's one at the hospital site, and there's one for, uh, around Sweetshire Park. So every time that happens, it's um, interesting to, to note. Uh, the, other, the only other thing I would say from, from what, what we talked about last time, just to clarify, I understand from my comments, there might have been a misunderstanding that we were going to recommend that we hire someone, that the RDC hire someone. And I think it was cleared up afterwards, but I want to make sure that everyone understands that we are we are actually going to be looking at the January 3rd meeting as a possible one to bring you an agreement that is between the city uh, and actually the Redevelopment Commission and the mill. And it would be the mill who would be bringing the resource on. So I just want to make sure that that was clear. But we would be contributing to we would be any of such person. That's right. We would be contributing fund funding to help support that, that resource that they would hire at so again, uh, January 3rd is the date that we're hoping to have that for. All right, thank you. Um, on to new business. First item of business is resolution 22-99, approval of updated lease for Fourth Street Garage, commercial slash office space. Who would like to speak in regards to this? I can cover it. And um, Larry, keep me honest here. So a couple things. One is I you know we're very pleased to have Hoosier Networks, which is the um, company that is uh, putting out the uh, fiber in Bloomington as a tenant here. Um, the probably the, the reason we're bringing this back to you, which you've reviewed once before, is they actually approached us to say uh, to to indicate that the tenant improvement total cost that they were bearing um, was higher than they expected, and so they came to us and asked us if we might be able to. Uh, you know, keeping in mind that they are going to be reimbursing that money to us, C could we cover, help co cover the difference to get the build app done? Um, I, in, in conferring with the controller's office, we thought that that was an appropriate request, and um, in exchange, have accelerated the payback period. So, so, you know, we're putting a little bit more on the table, we're getting things back uh, faster. So, what, so all of that is manifested in, on page two on the chart, uh, section one rent chart. Um, 
And basically what you'll see there, uh, year one is, is embedded in the paragraph, and then years two, three, four, and five are down below. Implicit in year one and two are accelerated repayment of, of uh, tenant improvement amounts. Um, year three has some amount of those left, and it's roughly 40%, 40%, 20%. So if you took the total $171,000 and broke it down, what you'll see is embedded in those numbers is a um, uh, year, year one and two have about 40% of the TI, and year three has about uh, the, the, the last uh, 20%. And then it kind of stabilizes into normal rents uh, starting at year four. That is primarily the, the difference. Larry, am I overlooking something? I know those are the material changes. So last time you all had just approved a, a fixed amount for the tenant improvements. We wanted to make sure that we were updating that. And then obviously, the material terms to the change in the uh, lease amounts. That's how, it's, how do I do it? All right, thank you. Do any commissioners have any questions? So can you just question? Kind of, oh, go, go ahead. ahead go ahead. So, sir, go ahead. I was just going to, could you clarify the change in the per <coughs> Clarify. It's okay. It's okay, Randy. You can you can ask your question. Well, so I actually broke it down. If if you're 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 talking about what's what the embedded amount is versus the base rent. No, the change in um, like what you're actually asking us to change from the the total amount that is additional to what we had already approved. Yeah, sorry, but I think so. The original one, uh, the tenant improvement was forty five dollars per square foot. And what had happened was the space that we realized the usable space was smaller. So that came out to be about, I, I think it was 109,000. I'll confirm this yes. uh, just as, as about 109,000. And so as you see in the resolution there, to make that up to about 171,000, which is what it was originally when we thought it was gonna be a larger space, that, that went from $45 a square foot to almost $70, a little over $70 per square foot. So that's kind of the difference of tenant improvement there. Uh, as Alex highlighted, though, it is paid back. Uh, I think the base rent starts at $18 per square foot, and then there's a dollar fifty every year added, and everything on top of that essentially is them paying back that tenant improvement for the first three years to the percentages Alex noted, 40, 40, 20. Okay, thank you. Okay, based on the fact that you know they went up in regards to what we had, is there a contingency in this at all? so that they don't have to come back to get this taken care of. It, you mean a, this, Randy, a contingency on their on their side or a contingency on? Yeah, it, it, just a contingency because, you know, based on the improvement, this is this is just a, this is a situation where we're funding it up front and then they're doing a three year lease payback on the bill. Es essentially, what I'm seeing is they, it was just an underestimation in regards to total build out cost yeah, they have uh, much better construction costs now, and I think that that's what's caused this number to, to become higher, that they realize that they have that gap and we're asking us to help them fill it. So I think they're in pretty good shape on, on their cost estimation. They, they are gonna be building this thing out over the next three months, so I, I don't expect a huge amount of variability in pricing in that relatively small amount of time. Um, and I should also add that the uh, interim period, they are leasing space from the Redevelopment Commission in the uh, South College or uh, the College Square building, so right. there's revenue coming in even in the interim period. Will, will we have any uh, needs for expenditures to make that property available? On the uh, the College Square? Yes, sir. No, uh, that was that that it. I was actually just in there. They're it, they're kind of in there, pretty low low tech folding chairs, folding tables, so there's not there's not a lot of investment at all that we're making uh, into that space. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions on resolution twenty two dash ninety nine? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Yeah, I'll move to approve resolution twenty two ninety nine. That's right. Sarah Bowerly Andrew. 
We have a first and a second. All those in favor, vote via roll call, please. Jim Putnam, yes. Sarah Beverly Hansen, yes. Deborah Mayerson, yes. Randy Cassidy, yes. City County, yes. Passes. Next item of business is resolution 22-100, approval of payment for power relocation for Hopewell, phase one east. If you'd like to speak to us regarding this. Durkis. Uh, Patrick Durkis, City Engineering Department. Um, for the uh, Hopewell development, phase one east uh, portion, uh, we vacated um, alleys that existed on the lot. Um, the way that uh, Duke fed the power through that area uh, resulted in um, basically from those alleys they actually routed power through the alley and ran it south on the north-south alley and then crossed First Street and fed two apartment complexes on the south side of First Street. Um, doesn't logically didn't really make sense of how they laid it out there, but uh, basically since that is where their existing power was and we removed the right of way with the vacation, um, we have to re we have to find a way to relocate that power. In addition to this cost, there's also uh, the relocation for the parking lot construction of Hopewell's uh, uh, transformer because Hopewell's transformer was served from the alley power source and so it's also part of this relocation. Um, Duke's uh, invoice and then also the work plans and material list. Um, Duke doesn't provide itemized billings, um, so that's uh, why the material list is in here, just trying to get a better feel for exactly what we are paying for. Uh, available for any questions. Any questions from commissioners on resolution 22-100? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Jim Hutton, I move to approve resolution 22-100. Deborah Myers, and I'll second. We have a first and a second. Uh, I need a vote via roll call, please. Jim Hutton, yes. Sarah Bauer-Leganson, yes. Temporary yes. Randy Cassidy, yes. Cindy Canardi, yes. Resolution passes. Next item of business is Resolution 22-101, approval of funding for a fifth ad addendum to engineering contract and rail <laughs> railroad agreement for the Beeline Trail and multi-use path. If you'd like to speak to us regarding this. Uh, Patrick Gervis, Engineering Department again, uh, covering this for uh, Roy is on vacation. Uh, this is uh, the addendum to Aztec Engineering Group's uh, PE contract. Um, the details of what that covers uh, are in an exhibit J packet, um, basically uh, covering additional costs for, uh, for bid support for the project. Project administration um, for the project up to date, um, and then additional utility and railroad coordination. Um, then there's also a revised acquisition cost for uh, for right of way. Um, those revised acquisition costs for the right of way basically is a result of uh, of deed gaps. So basically, as we as we drew out the uh, drew out the property descriptions, there were uh, gaps between. Uh, adjacent properties, and so that triggers uh, using uh, the fee schedule that NDOT has for right of way acquisitions. Triggers uh, basically it's treated as another parcel, so you have to pay for it like it's a whole other parcel, even though it's just a gap that <laughs> is uh, mistaken in the original deeds. Um, and then the uh, the payment for um, the railroad coordination. Standard practice for the for the railroads when a project is presented to them, um, they provide or retain outside consultants to review the plans. They provide us an estimate of what they believe those costs will be, and uh, and then request that payment uh, prior to uh, 
to reviewing the plans or performing the coordination. So it is the cost of uh, doing a project near, near the railroad. Uh, available for any questions. Are there any questions um, from commissioners regarding resolution 22-101? I'm just curious why there's this is gaps are still coming up. I would have thought as a layperson coming in to, to see that switch air park and everything down to it, the V-line trail is all, all produced. And I would have expected that all this agreement with the trains, the train company, long past. So this is a result of the being parallel to the railroad uh, that is between Adams and Fountain, so not where the B-Line currently exists. Mm -hmm. um, and so the railroads, uh, their coordination agreements state that if you are within, um, I believe it's either 60 or 90 feet of the track, mm -hmm. they ask that you coordinate with them. Oh. And so this, uh, this spur is managed by Indiana Railroad, but ultimately owned by CSX. <laughs> so it's been a, it's been a long uh, yeah. process of, uh, of working through that. Um, but we've, we've, we've worked with CSX enough now that, that this is the coordination that is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the gaps, the gaps are, uh, are uh, in right-of-way parcels that are actually along Fountain Drive. Mm -hmm. um, it's common in older parts of town that haven't had redevelopments um, that just we are we are capable of a higher level of accuracy now um, than than previous uh, measurements in the field and so when you mark out the deeds and you find a, a gap um, you know there's a few ways to solve it but basically a, a reply of the area or or a correction to the deeds and so, um, so in this case, uh, since the city is just attempting to, or needs to acquire the, the property to do their work, um, we, we wouldn't have like a, a basis to actually go and clean up their deeds. All we can say is, some, between you two property owners, one of you own this, and we'd like to purchase it. And so that, that's the result of this cleaning up these last minute, last minute bits and pieces. Yeah, and I think it's it's just mm -hmm. this area uh, is just older part of town with, without um, as well-defined property. Uh, if you look at like the roads and right-of-way through there, there's, it varies a lot more than what we sure. see in, uh, in, in, in the um, you know, Bloomington original plot yeah. downtown area. Thank you. Um, so this brings the cost of the preliminary engineering to up to about 50%, a little bit less than 50% of the um, estimated construction costs. And so I'm just curious if you can give us a sense that this is standard for projects like this um, to have the cost of preliminary engineering um, coming, you know, that is that big of a percentage of the actual construction costs or if it's out of line with kind of what we would normally expect here and to the extent that it's out of line, you know, it sounds like it might be just because of these issues around um, the deed gaps, but just kind of wanted to get a check from you about, you know, does this seem in line with expectations or out of line with expectations? Um, I, since I'm covering, from, I, okay. where did you get the, uh, the construction estimate? So down so the last page of the resolution oh, okay. has um, the project phases and then the estimated cost for step one preliminary engineering is now at $1,041,425 and then the construction which is step four is $2,231,500. Okay. Uh, I guess my, my question, I, I wanted to make sure that I was uh, referencing the right numbers. Um, I, I can't say for sure if this is the current construction estimate, uh, but I, I I know that their the construction costs have gone up. I'm not sure if this is the exact correct number, um, but.
but uh, getting kind of more to what your actual question was in relation to uh, design costs versus construction costs, um, the the percentages are are typically looked at as as the design uh, services only, but this design cost also includes the right of way services because our designer is coordinating the right of way, and so they. Um, Basically, the, the appraisals, uh, the surveyors involved, um, and also our buyer involved. And so, uh, when we have a large right of way acquisition, um, the normal percentages that we see are not going to really fall into place. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but um, a, a significant portion of this cost is, is the right-of-way services. Um, they're basically set prices uh, through NDOT's right-of-way acquisition services. Since it's a LPA project, we use their their uh, their prices. And uh, so I would, knowing how much right-of-way is being acquired on this project, uh, I would say that there, uh, a large portion of it is for right-of-way acquisition. Um, but I don't have that breakdown. Okay, so you wouldn't say that that kind of raises any red flags to you that? I personally do not know enough about the project okay. to tell you, but I will say that uh, I, I believe that a large part of it, percentage-wise, is, is right-of-way acquisition services, which you typically wouldn't look at when you, right. when you do your percentage. Thank you, and thank you for stepping in. Sure, he appreciates it. <laughs> Are there any other questions on Resolution 22-101? Is there any public comment? Not hearing any. Um, I'll entertain a motion for Resolution 22-101. Bill Hutton? Aye. I make a motion to approve Resolution 22-101. Sarah Bauer, Lydia, and I'll second. We have a first and a second. I need a vote via roll call, please. Deb Hutton, yes. Sarah Bauer, Lydia, yes. Deborah Meyerson, yes. Randy Cassidy, yes. And Cindy Canardi, yes. <coughs> um, resolution passes. Next item of business is resolution 22-102 to increase funding for an owner-occupied rehabilitation project at 301 North Hopewell. Who'd like to speak regarding this? Uh, John Zodi of the Hand Department. Thank you, Madam President and Commissioners. Um, so we're back taking a look at 301 Hopewell. Um, this project, uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel, um, but we did have an unforeseen uh, issue come up that sort of will almost directly calculate to the amount of money that we we're asking for extra. And so I'll go through this. If you look toward the screen, I do want to mention that John Hewitt, our program manager for um, uh, uh, Title 16 and, and our other programs is on with us uh, remotely. Um, and John can elaborate where I fall short. But basically the, the consideration tonight is to, uh, it, well, let me say in your packet was a spreadsheet which had uh, outlined several expenses and a number of change orders that were laid out. We are basically looking at change order number seven forward and asking for your consideration for approval of those expenses. We are basically at around $97,000, uh, maybe a little more, and the $100,000 cap that we had is, uh, is what you approved uh, at a previous meeting. So the big change in this project was as the uh, rehabilitation was going on, rewiring had to happen, new insulation had to happen. Um, there was a change in building code, and this is where I might ask John to chime in here in a minute. But um, when you look at the house uh, and the outside structure, uh, keeping it stabilized was what is happening here. So when you, when you have the insulation, you take off the siding, what is in there? What is behind the siding? And it's sort of particle, hard particle board, and uh, tie back, which is what you see in a lot of external houses. What it's doing, if you look at my visual aid here, it's we don't want the house to do this, right? This keeps the house. You put paneling on the outside that stabilizes the house so that it's not doing this, right? 
we don't want it to do that, obviously. So that's what this project did. That ended up being about $18,000 to fix that. And we didn't anticipate that uh, moving into this, but once we started peeling back the onion, um, that's, what, that's what we had. And that was also due to a change in building code from what the house was when it was uh, put there and what it is now. John, would you say anything uh, different there? Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, this is John Hewitt. That's correct. Um, I think in, in the, the first meeting that we had, uh, Deborah Meyerson brought up the, the question of is this module or, uh, or uh, you know, manufactured house. And in, in this case, the fact that it was a manufactured house built under um, a HUD federal code instead of a state code, uh, it's built in a, in a building with all of the components glued under optimal conditions. So the, the drywall was glued in place, the exterior foam board sheeting was glued in place, and all of that added structural stability to the building uh, that was required under the HUD code that it was built under. And now, because of the fact that we're doing all of this work under the Indiana Residential Code, um, we were required by the building department to bring in a structural engineer to uh, get uh, an actual sign stamped uh, drawing requiring us to add a half inch OSB to the exterior of the structure. So we had to take off the exterior vinyl siding, remove the, the foam board uh, sheathing that was on the house that was glued in place and stable. Scrape all the glue off that and then put on a, a four inch brand board, half inch thick, that uh, in, as, you know, as John just sort of demonstrated, that will keep the, the structure rigid to the point where it, it won't uh, yaw or, or sway back and forth, you know, from corner to corner. And, um, when we were first discussing the, the possibility of having to do something on the exterior, we anticipated only having the structural corners, but um, both the Monroe County Building Departments and uh, the structural engineer from Tinland Engineering uh, and the drawing that he provided uh, required us to go to the full exterior of the structure with uh, putting its grand board from the from basically the foundation line up to the, the ceiling line in the you know the nine feet or eight eight feet or nine feet whatever that is um, to create the structure that was built into it in the factory that we removed by fixing all of the defects that were caused to the structure. So I hope I didn't over explain that but that's that's what happened. Thanks John. So with all that uh, anticipated home return date um, is January 6th if everything gets done with the additional uh, costs. A um, couple side items just to let you know. Uh, South Central Community Action Program is repairing ductwork for the heating uh, for free. She was, uh, there was a new furnace donated last year. And so what happened was the ductwork would have been sort of eaten and rotted away. And so staff is coming in this week, if not today, fixing that. There's a GoFundMe account that's been set up by uh, the resident's sort of advocate who is helping her and working with us. All the lighting has been purchased and some other things for the house have been purchased with that, those funds. And that may pay for one week of housing. We are figuring that out now. Um, the resident's being housed at a hotel. Um, and her uh, dog, her pet, has been uh, boarded uh, thanks to the Monroe County Humane Association two weeks for free with a full round of vaccines. and then. There is a boarding expense after that. Uh, the dog is now with her at a hotel um, because I was experiencing some anxiety and we had to get that resolved. And so uh, they are at another hotel now. Um, I was there today, actually delivered the dog um, back to her. Um, and so we're um, all set with the next phase here. So just to kind of cut and paste what is additional on the spreadsheet to you. Um, this out there the, here tonight that shows you what the additional is the um, housing, what we were paying, and then what the additional is here to uh, house her for another two to three weeks while the finishes are done with painting and everything else. So uh, I'll leave it there and uh, happy to 
contain questions. Appreciate consideration this project. Question? Yeah. Even though $150 is really minimal compared to $106,000 total, mm -hmm. uh, why are, is there an install recirculating rate to it for $150,000 Later, it for uh, John, could you speak to that? Did you hear the question about the range of um, the difference between recirculating and just a, a range hood? Is that is that the question? Well, why is well, there, two, there why is the range hood itemized twice? Yeah, there are two of them on there for the same price, hundred fifty twice. Uh, I, I would assume that my core skills with an Excel spreadsheet uh, would make the would make that the the uh, issue. Okay. Um, it's it's yes simply um, part of uh, actually part of that um, I think comes from the fact that we. If you change order A, refunds noted in column F, uh, we hid column F and all that, but there was there were two line items for, for the range hood. Um, and since the, the range hood was first uh, part of the, the initial write-up, maybe change order five or something like that, um, and it, it got backed out because, or it got changed. It, it came from a line item that was from the from the builder to install the range hood with the cost of the range hood included in the his write up his his uh, change order or his estimate for that um, when the advocate uh, took money from the GoFundMe and purchased all of the lighting fixtures she also purchased a range hood so that came down from uh, simply all, doing everything concerning the range hood down to him uh, installing one that was provided, the, the hood was provided by the GoFundMe account. And so what we see there is a, is a dollar amount of 150 for um, during, uh, installing a line, uh, yeah, a, an electrical line to it, and then also, um, you know, prepping for that work um, instead of having the full price that was that included the cost for the, the range hood and I, I simply probably doubled it up I was removing one and and adjusting the other or something of that nature. Thank you. That's my best guess. Thank you. So I have a just a couple of questions, but what is our average cost of one of these projects? Uh, much less it would be so our cap as you know it's 38.5 and then we raise it to 50. Um, it varies I would say John you may have better information than me but um, I know we're looking at one for 15,000 up to uh, you know over 50 or so so probably within that range so this is one of that for sure. And then the next question would be what what provisions do we have or don't have in our mortgage or loan documents that, that would prevent, you know, the condition of the house to deteriorate to, you know, such a degree in the future? Yeah, so we have a um, requirement for it. So the agreements that were signed uh, uh, allow us to do inspections annually. There's also a provision in the mortgage document that we can do that when we feel it's appropriate. Um, the mortgage speaks to the condition of the property and that it should be maintained in an appropriate manner. If we do an inspection and something's not done, we would we're gonna ask that those things be done. If they are, the resident's not able to pay for them, we would have them done and put a lien on the property. Um, when such time that there might not be, that this resident may no longer be there, um, any liens on the property, as you, as you may know, and the mortgage would not, the property would not be able to be sold without our getting paid back everything in full. So. Um, so there'll so be a lien on the property for 111,000 for 875 based well, on be, this. So whatever the final expense is, we'll update the mortgage and make that the mortgage amount, um, and that would, that would be what you have to be paid back. It's a deferred mortgage, so she is uh, able to pay on that if she wishes, or it's deferred. But the property would not be able to be released from 
outside of her ownership or ours without us getting that money back. If there were additional repairs, so we go in and in two years there's something wrong that had to be fixed that she couldn't do, um, and we paid for it, we put a lien on the property that way. So that couldn't be uh, resolved either until that were paid back. So that's, those are our protections, if you will. And still, you know, the um, financial outlook of the city is quite a bit here in the mortgage, but um, there are protections in place for what we so what would you say the, the new value would be for this property based on the improvements that have been done? I don't know. What will happen, what we're going to do is have an appraisal done afterwards. So there's HUD guidelines require that um, uh, there's a per subsidy amount, which we're under, um, per unit subsidy is what they call it. We're under that amount. And then the after rehab value of the home cannot be greater than 95% of median purchase price. Uh, which according to HUD this year is 243000 I think. So we just need to make sure that the after rehab value of the home is under that, which I think it will be. Um, but uh, that's, those are the federal guidelines that we have to sort of move within. So we'll button all that up when we're done with this. Thank you. So uh, I had a couple questions. One is um, in terms of being proactive, and this isn't about this specific property, but just are there ways in terms of properties that the city is likely to support to be in a position to, as applicable, be proactive to support repair sooner so that, and I don't know like if, if there was, you know, obviously there was extensive circumstances. I'm just trying to get a sense of if this is completely directed by the owner um, or occupant when repairs like this come in or if there's any inspection process that helps to identify issues before they get worse? That's a great question. I would say, uh, Commissioner Meyerson, um, short of this situation, so in this situation we have a homeowner who has, there's been a lot, I think most of you know kind of what the history here is, and who has an advocate that's been helping. And she has been a tremendous help here in um, making sure that the homeowner has additional things than what we're able to do. I think it's uh, quite honestly tough at our current capacity. Um, without looking at sort of a neighborhood project and you know, with the input of the neighborhood saying this, here are a number of houses, I think I would want to engage neighborhoods there. That's what comes to my mind. Uh, because it is very tough for us to sort of look at the outside of the house when it's owner occupied We don't have any sort of jurisdiction to go in there unless it's a rental as you know, so I think it's a tough Situation, but I'm you know open to ideas. I think it would uh, you know if there's a way to involve the neighborhoods uh, I think that would be um, The way that the path forward there in this particular neighborhood We've had property across the street that we recently abated meaning we went and cleaned out uh, tons of, literally tons of uh, debris and things from the yard. So uh, when we look at sort of tackling neighborhoods, uh, sometimes that's complaint driven. Sometimes that's the owner coming to us and finally you know, submitting an application for a rehab. Other times uh, we're not able to do that. Um, so current capacity makes that pretty, makes the goal of your question, I think, which is a good one, pretty tough, uh, to be honest. Thank you. Um one other question that is specific about this property, just you had described the difference between that the original construction was done to HUD manufactured home standards, but that in the stage of rehabilitation, that the, there's the question of bringing it up to code for state and local code. <coughs> Does HUD have any guidelines for rehabilitation? I'm just trying to clarify this there. Given that they have standards for the original construction, is there nothing for rehab that would be kind of applicable under these kind of circumstances. Um, just trying to understand the system a little better. John, could you speak to that, please? If you yeah, yeah so, uh, so the guidelines that we have written, that we work through, yeah, the, the, the rehab guidelines in the department uh, state that um, our rehab projects the goal is to bring them up to current code requirements. So if we go into a house built in 1950, um, for just a, a general example, 
we pick a house that's 1950. Someone comes to us and say, I need my foundation fixed. And uh, we know that that foundation is going to cost $20,000, give or take, to, to make the foundation repairs. That puts him out of, outside of the uh, emergency home repair requirements and, and into basically an owner occupied rehab situation, which is what we have here. So our own guidelines and standards say that we must build, bring this building that was built in 1950 to 1950 standards up to current standards for electrical, plumbing, uh, efficiency of the mm -hmm. furnaces, etc., and um, sort of those, uh, all of the requirements, plumbing, electrical, uh, energy efficiency, all of those things. And, and, and that's the goal of the program is to improve the housing stock in Bloomington for those people that own their homes and have uh, lowered income. But as, as we're doing that, it, we, we use the current code for these HUD homes. The, in this particular instance, the, the home was built to a standard that the state of Indiana has refused to uh, set the standard for. So manufactured housing must be HUD's housing uh, for manufactured homes. Uh, and the state of Indiana doesn't um, have a, a standard for that type of home. So the, we are then uh, required because we hold a building permit or the, the contractor has has uh, applied for it and follows the application process for a building permit, we need to meet then the, the current residential code from the state of Indiana. Um, does that answer the question or did I go too far in the wrong direction with that answer? No, no, it definitely does help answer the question. I'm just trying to get a sense of since the original construction standards were obviously different than state standards, if there were any alternate, um, and it sounds like the answer is no, there's no alternate standards to apply for this type of structure given that it had a different, again, it was how manufacturer standards as opposed to state building code. Um, and so getting maybe a little bit back to some of the questions about the improvement cost and the total assessed cost, and just trying to understand if it puts this kind of repair in a difficult situation because it might be improving the property to a standard that is overvalued based on some of the limits, which it sounds like it is not, but that was just some of the earlier discussion that we were having. I was trying to understand the different options that are available when doing a rehabilitation of this type, specifically on this type of structure. So I think you covered it, but if there's anything else that you think would be applicable, feel free to mention. <laughs> um, in, in answer to that, I am completely unaware of something that, that would be a standard to rehabilitate a manufactured home. I, I'm not aware of a standard for that. It's, it's you build it to that, and that's it. And then if you know any modifications, go to a different code, which okay. came as a surprise to us during this. <laughs> okay, no, it's part of the learning process, and I appreciate your sharing that with me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions from um, commissioners? I see Randy's got his hand up. Quick question in regards to, I know this has been an ongoing, continuous situation. We've all learned from it as we went through it. Are we done as of January 6th? Sylvia will be moved back in. We'll have a mortgage of approximately 111 five or a little more. Is that where this ends up at? Yes, yeah, so, she, so yeah, January 6th is sort of estimated, but as soon as possible, if not before. Uh, and then that's, yes, that's correct. We would have the mortgage. Uh, updated and uh, that's where it stands. Okay, so we won't be incurring additional costs coming back on this particular project. Not that we can uh, foresee right now, Commissioner. I just leave it there. I, I, I honestly don't, but I, I'm not going to say you guys bill of goods ever, and I, um, I don't anticipate that. We have this kind of John chimed in, but I think we are. We've had that conversation a number of times, and. Um, that's, uh, we think this is, this is going to be it, so. Yeah, that's because as I see the additional cost you know, for housing and such, mm -hmm. obviously we've got a situation we have to deal with, finish up, 
and get the uh, resident back in their home. Yeah. So, with that, uh, it's appropriate. I'll make a motion to approve. All right, we have a motion for approval from Randy. Is there a second? No problem. Second. Don't have to ask, so I chose not to. Okay. 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 I have no second. All right, we have a first and a second. Um, I need a vote via roll call, please. Deb Hutton, yes. Sarah Bowerly Danson, yes. Jennifer Meyerson, yes. Randy Cassidy, yes. And Cindy Canardi, yes. Resolution passes. Uh, next item of business is the resolution 22-103 that was passed out um, at the start of the meeting. Uh, who would like to speak to us regarding this? I can, Madam President. Um, this is for the home vote neighborhood, as you all recall, uh, or, uh, or like late last year in 21, in resolution of 2180, you all approved an agreement with Warshaw to kind of provide some of the marketing and branding services for the Hopewell neighborhood. Uh, they have been able to complete most of those services, which included the, the development of kind of uh, signage and kind of a visual theme for the neighborhood. Um, the city solicited quotes. We got a quote from Everywhere Signs, which I think they, they was the best quote for $1,600 per sign, uh, for three signs that they would like to put up in the neighborhood, uh, in the Hopewell neighborhood while it's kind of in this median process of uh, we've completed or we mostly completed demolition. Obviously, I can help on their side. It's rapidly uh, moving forward with their demolition. So these would be signs to kind of advertise what's going to be there at the neighborhood and kind of um, put something there as a marker for, for what's coming. Uh, I will say that there was, a, there was an update from the resolution that I was able to pass out, but it did not include, so it included the $1,600 per sign for three signs for a total of $4,800. Uh, what I, I then received and, and was able to confirm immediately after was that it did not include the price for installation of the sign. So um, whoever moves to approve this, I would, I would if, if you so choose to move to approve it, I would ask that you approve it as amended to add thirteen hundred to then sixty dollars for installation of the signs as well. Uh, so that would be a grand total of six thousand one hundred sixty dollars for the printing and manufacturing of the signs, and then also the installation on site of the signs uh, for the local neighborhood. Um, the resolution that I have in front of me includes that um, thirteen. $160 for installation. I was able to send it to Christina and she was very good about uh, getting that printed off for you all, but I'm just telling everybody on, on the meeting publicly because I don't think that that went out broadly. So that's why I'm saying I'm happy for it to be uh, for it as amended so that we have give the public notice of what, what we're actually approving. I see. Okay, uh, I'll make a motion to approve it as amended. Um, I've got a comment for public record. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the first is in one, two, three, in the fourth, whereas uh, there, if the rest of the RDC is approval of an agreement. Yeah. It's just a word. Thank you. And the second thing, in, now that the installation cost has been included, it would seem that in exhibit A on page three, at the bottom of the table, number 10 line, Probably should be changed from 4800 to 6150. That's correct. That should also be amended. That should be part of the amendment. Thank you. Motion. All right. Any other questions from commissioners on resolution 22 101 or 103? And uh, I believe we have a, a motion to approve from Randy. Is that correct? Yes, as amended. As amended. On vote. Resolution to take. Okay. Is there a second? Um, Sarah Bauer. I'll second. All right. We have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor, I need a vote via roll call, please. Deb Hutton, yes. Sarah Bauer Lee Danson, yes. Deb Hutton, yes. Randy Cassidy, yes. And Cindy Canardi, yes. Resolution 22-103 is approved. Um, next item of business is any business or general discussion from the commissioners. 
Not hearing any, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So approved. All right, we have a first. And a second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everyone.